Welcome to uh, Unit 7. This is Biology 110. Uh, this is the laboratory section. Uh, this uh, is designed for uh, the lecture on mitosis and meiosis uh, portion of the lab and it gives you a good view of what's going on. In addition, I'll be covering some aspects of karyotyping and how important that is. So uh, without uh, too much more delay, let's uh, continue on. So what we're going to try to cover in this uh, section is understanding the cell cycle, naming uh, the stages of the mitosis. Uh, we're going to try to get over very uh, subtly the difference between mitosis and meiosis. Now really all we're going to be talking about is mitosis and then when we get into meiosis this is a bolt-on or an added step to reduce the number of, of chromosomes thus making four cells instead of two that we see in mitosis. So meiosis uh, you can always recognize if you have four cells at the end and hopefully by the end you'll understand why but uh, I'll go ahead and tell you that it's a haploid state in other words it has half the chromosome content so therefore you have twice the number of cells and these are required for the sex cells the sperm and the eggs where regular uh, somatic cells or regular body cells uh, has two uh, at the end of mitosis and that's for maintenance and just replicating cells uh, to keep uh, dead ones from uh, causing problems that uh, we need to, to take care of housekeeping so uh, and we'll go on uh, from there but meiosis also uh, sets up a situation where we can have rearrangement of chromosomes so primarily mitosis is for cell division that produces new cells and it, it's a good thing that they're regulated for various things can you imagine if your eyebrows grew as fast as your regular hair grows and that sort of thing and so everything is regulation uh, big time. Now we don't want our bodies of course have to be very efficient in terms of controlling the energy and everything for maintenance of life but uh, in general uh, different types of cells have different regulation in terms of when it divides and, and that sort of thing. We need cells to divide so we can produce more of them to repair damages uh, various uh, cells in various locations have different uh, life cycles so if you look in the gut when we have a lot of bacteria and turnover and absorption and that sort of thing versus the stomach where there's very low pH and acidity and you can imagine more cells uh, have to turn over faster in those sorts of regions blood cells have to have a certain number and so that's tightly regulated and, and so on and so forth the regulation of cell cycle, I just want to emphasize, there's a lot of writing on the slide, but the idea is I want to convey, uh, it's not a simple thing, uh, and that's a good thing, because when uh, we have certain cells that die of programmed death and that sort of thing, part of it is to prevent uh, cells from becoming cancerous, which is a real problem, and hence the whole point of uh, going into this aspect of it is just know that we have regulation in place to prevent uh, the carnage of cancer and those sorts of bad things that can occur. So if you look at uh, just comparing mitosis and meiosis right off the top this is the shortcut cut to the chase. Uh, for mitosis we have two daughter cells at the end of its division and in meiosis we have four daughter cells. Now they are different in the daughter cells of mitosis they're diploid in other words they have a full complement and of course you're going to need that for all the cells now not all cells have the key, you know all the keys for the kingdom in other words they turn on and utilize the whole genome which um, since the embryo stage we don't do that uh, but later on in life certain cells have certain uh, subset of keys that turn on certain genes that those cells need and so we we have the full complement now when we're doing a genetic experiment where we're getting recombination uh, the daughter cells of meiosis are in important because there we provide half of the complement of that parent so the two parents together we get a, a, a new blend of genetics and in, uh, in the offspring and that's a good thing. 
the cell cycle you can see is uh, div really divided up into G1, the synthesis phase, G2, and then we go into mitosis. So let me explain. The G1 is just the normal day-to-day -day operations that go on. Uh, the synthesis phase is at some point in time uh, the nucleus says, okay, we need now to do a spin-off. Enough time has gone on. And so we start synthesizing copies of DNA so that we can now get ready for a duplication event. G2 is that time where we're getting ready. And so the G2 is sort of calling the moving company to get the boxes, everything in the boxes and that sort of thing, and getting ready for the move. The mitotic phase is the move. So we go through a series of steps for mitosis, and then at the end of the process with a su sufficient move, we get cytokinesis. That's the end of uh, what we need to do. So the mitosis is broken up into these steps. You see prophase, prometaphase, metaphase, anaphase, and telophase. Now really, prophase uh, is the early part where you actually see the boxes getting ready for the move. Uh, you can see the DNA, in other words. Metaphase, they start lining up in the middle. M, middle, metaphase. It's the only one that starts with M, and think of it as the align alignment in the middle of the cell. Anaphase, they're being pulled to the opposite poles. So the two uh, sister chromatids are being pulled to either ends of the cell, and so it forms an A as it's being pulled. You can see the, the tail is kind of dragging. And I, I view that as just put a little cross member across there. And you got an A. And uh, anaphase is the only one that starts with A. So you can think of that. Telophase is your end. You, know, you extend the telescope out all the way it can go uh, at the end of it. The telophase is where the cells are right before they split uh, from each other. And cytokinesis completes that process. So this is uh, just more detail about what I was just stating. So you have a slide or uh, feedback as to what's going on. But you can also see uh, the stages here. The prophase is sort of, you can see all the DNA, that sort of thing. And it's getting ready for that particular move. Uh, the prometaphase and metaphase, the, the whole point of this is that the, the chromosomes are lining up in the middle. But notice the spindle fibers throughout this. This is typically overlooked in terms of uh, the types of things we talk about in mitosis and it shouldn't be because it's really incredible what goes on in that stage. Anaphase you can see the chromosomes being pulled to either side of the poles and then telophase is that pinching uh, of the cells and you can, they kind of look like two opposing parachutes uh, it's typical of telophase and then uh, the cytokinesis finishes the process. So what I wanted to talk briefly about, I've already used some of the nomenclature in context. If you remember, I mentioned something about sister chromatids being pulled to either end. And this is a diagram showing that sort of uh, uh, conversation. Centromeres and uh, kinephores are the regions where the work is getting done being uh, separated or pulled. So we have the conochore uh, microtubules, the K fibers, and these attach. Well, I could just leave it at that and just move on, but the attachment and how this actually happens is quite interesting. Uh, the kind of cores in the spindle microtubules are sort of like nanotechnology of these uh, nanotubes that emanate out it very carefully. If you can think of the cell moving a little bit because of uh, Brownian movement, they're, they're ever so easily teased apart and as as this process goes on and they're pulled the the pulling process is uh, accomplished through microtubules and little nano machines that actually pull very much like muscle contraction or if you've seen uh, other videos uh, perhaps in class of the uh, the kinesians that uh, travel and transfer bags of freshly made things, or bags they say, phospholipid um, bilayer enclosed uh, proteins that have been made that are now moved to various uh, places within the cell. So here's the uh, diagram showing in motion things moving. And if I were to zoom in a little bit in the area that really matters, you can see that there's more detail uh, than I want you to know. Just look at the complexity of, of the attachment. If you, th you think about this, 
The last thing you want to do is rip, tear, and damage DNA at this stage, which could happen. And so there's a sufficient amount of care that's taken within this at the molecular level. And if you're interested in these things, there's all sorts of uh, interesting uh, papers and things. But there's uh, some, uh, the nanomotors that I'm talking about are sort of the dienes. And they uh, move these by walking down in a direction that pulls the uh, chromosomes apart by uh, moving on the infrastructure of those spindle fibers. So these are the spindles, uh, the spindle fibers uh, here, the green. And these walk, uh, these nanomachines walk on, on that surface pulling now the chromosome parts here uh, to the directions that uh, are indicated in the opposite direction. So we get that pulling across and it's, it, I would be remiss if I didn't include that in my conversation as far as what goes on in mitosis because you know all this is going on and uh, we need to, to talk about it. So you can see a lot of complexity uh, but all I want you to see is this is to note the, the motor part that uses ATP that actually moves downward on the microtubules uh, carrying uh, the complex as you can see it's attached to the uh, catechore and uh, moves that down so that's that's all I just wanted you to see is that it's not really magical well it, it's it's amazing what goes on uh, but it's understandable so mitosis is the process of division where we get two daughter cells and they're identical and it's broken up into interphase prophase metaphase anaphase and telophase and uh, these are of course the important stages that uh, uh, we needed to, to, to talk about today uh, all of these of which are very easy we've already sort of mentioned all of this but this kind of steps in a little bit more detail just so that uh, I can compare now animal and plant cells and this will uh, offset the uh, the need for uh, you actually looking at them uh, on the scope today so you can see the animal cell and the plant cell is sort of a button but you can kind of see uh, a little bit more detail uh, in when we move from the interface into the prophase you can actually make out the chromosomes and they're being delineated that's where I use the analogy of the shipping box uh, so that they're a little bit more pronounced and it makes it easier for the DNA to move it's sort of a lamp brush type of environment where it takes on that look but it's important that it's it's in the moving stage and not in the more vulnerable or tearing uh, easily to tear stage uh, so prophase provides uh, the DNA to be in the right kind of uh, configuration for this. And then we move into the metaphase. I'm not so, so much worried about the pro-metaphase. But you just look at the metaphase and they're lining up in the middle. And so you can see on both plant and animal um, that they line up in the middle. And you can see the spindle fibers more pronounced in the, uh, the animal cell here and uh, the plant cell a little bit harder but what we have because plants are outside they have this uh, more pronounced cell wall and that is uh, important for the plant of course uh, to make sure that uh, the plant survives in uh, harsh temperatures and water and, and all of those things uh, so that's why that's there the anaphase is the, the part where we're pulling to the uh, opposite ends of the pole and you can see the, the spindle fibers but uh, in this case you can actually see the uh, the legs or the arms of the chromosomes being pulled while at the centromere here either either end allows these to go across and you could make an A across here because uh, for anaphase because they're being pulled to either ends of the, the cell and um, forming that A-like structure. So you look for that and you can easily... Yeah, mitosis just tells you what's going on if you look at it carefully. Uh, it's, it's really straightforward. The telophase is at the end. We're starting to see the contractual ring and uh, the, the actual division. And you can see the two opposing uh, parachutes. If I like to look at it that way, I guess, is one way to look. And it's being pinched in at the middle here. 
and that is uh, for the animal and then you see the uh, plate being formed on the plant and that's what you look for in the telophase stage and it's, it's really quite noticeable uh, for that and here's all of the animal mitosis you can see uh, you can see the interphase and then uh, the interphase here and the prophase here and the prophase you can see where the DNA is metaphase is lining up in the middle so you can see there anaphase we're making the A's as they're going across being pulled to either side and uh, the telophase you're getting that pinching in and uh, you can see it's much more pinched in perhaps than you can see in this region here and that's your telophase and then the uh, cytokinesis part you can actually see the two cells so uh, hopefully you can delineate uh, all of that in that one review uh, and it's what you would have looked like uh, look for in the, the cells in, in the lab the plant it's even easier if you can see what looks like a cat eye or fish eye and then we move to a very different stage you can see in the prophase uh, the metaphase lining up in the middle the anaphase where we can make the A and that's because they're being pulled to, to the opposite ends so a look at it is the A here we have the the telophase forming and that uh, that plate the separation plate and you can see it pronounced here where it's now becoming two cells and so that is mitosis in the plants which is a little bit different uh, than we see uh, for the animal and so now if we look at the, the big difference in meiosis is just additional divisional step for meiosis and that is to make the somatic cells that we've had in for mitosis these are for sex cells and these uh, are haploid cells in other words they have half the complement and that's so we can conduct a genetic experiment where we now take the two haploid states to make a new diploid organism and so you can see that uh, sort of uh, where the egg and sperm meet now we'll create a new diploid organism but it uh, is as a result of the meiosis that provides uh, that haploid state and in order to do that we have to have an additional chromosomal division and cell division where we end up with four cells so if you're ever asked on a lab practical uh, what is, is this the result of mitosis or meiosis if you got four cells it's meiosis if you have two mitosis and uh, that's pretty straightforward so mitosis is asexual my, meiosis is for sexual cells the sex cells cells divide once cells divide twice in uh, meiosis because of course you get in that reductional so you get four cells instead of two you have two at the end of mitosis that are diploid that continues on in meiosis where those now create four haploid daughter cells uh, one of the big differences between the two of course is the genetic information is different in the cells because there's a crossing over event when you have the single stranded uh, type of uh, arrangement well, not single stranded but one copy of the chromosome uh, as a result of uh, the division and that makes it to for more of ability for crossing over to occur so cytogenetics is going to shift the uh, gears now uh, cytogenetics is a big field of course if somebody has uh, a, you know let's say a pregnant and they go to the doctor and they get in a, a regular sort of uh, urinalysis test and there's something wrong and they want to get more information they can do that with uh, cytokinesis uh, where they can go in and uh, look at cells uh, uh, by taking a sample uh, in the amniotic fluid and uh, this technique can be dangerous but it's usually uh, accompanied with a sonogram or some sort of visualization technique to make sure the needle doesn't hurt the baby and that sort of thing uh, so we're going to talk about the the key reason why we're doing this amniotic sampling is uh, to look at the chromosomes and then from that we can determine if the child might be at risk for a particular uh, genetic disease or that sort of thing and there are a fair amount of disorders that can occur and that's what we're trying to ferret out with uh, karyotyping there's several types and there's new ones now and with the human genome project 
uh, everything's going to change. You're, you're going to be able to get your se DNA sequenced uh, while you wait uh, pretty much in the future, in, in your lifetime, probably even sooner, um, as in 10 years or so. Uh, cytogenetics really depends on looking at the, the chromosome arrangement by a unique banding pattern and where the centromere so we can kind of look at all the chromosomes to see how they fit together. The chromosome number in humans is we have 46 chromosomes or 23 pair. So haploid is 23 chromosomes because that's half of the complement of 46. So a diploid organism is represented here have 46 chromosomes or 23 pair. A dog has 78 chromosomes or 39 pair. Uh, goldfish have 94 chromosomes or 74 pair. Are they, are they smarter than we are? I don't know. We'll come back and talk about that. Lettuce, 18 chromosomes or 9 pair. So you can see various different types by species. And that sort of what sets up species is the number of chromosomes and the ability now to exchange that uh, genetic information at the haploid uh, or sex cell end. Uh, but you can see various uh, numbers of, of chromosomes a dog we mentioned already. Compare that to a goat or sheep or a pig and that sort of thing. You can see that. And there are some weird uh, aberrations, I guess, when it comes to the genetics. If you made a horse and a donkey, you get a mule. Uh, but because of that, uh, the mules usually, we typically don't see them reproducing and they're sterile as an offspring. But uh, mules have been used... Uh, through history for uh, moving and doing a lot of the heavy lifting in our history in the United States. Uh, so if you look at the uh, overall karyotypes of a donkey versus a domestic horse, you can see the, the layout of the various chromosomes that would make them uh, unique. And the fruit flies are no different. Uh, you can look at eight chromosomes and uh, very similar, uh, we can do the karyotyping in uh, the uh, fruit flies and you can see a, a, a small rendition of a karyotype of a human and that happens to be a male because you have the X and Y at the 23rd chromosome. How we get these characteristic looks it, it's a very straightforward is because DNA is wound around proteins, the system of proteins called nucleosomes and then these nucleosomes create these uh, sort of bendable type of histone uh, wads, I guess, of DNA you can compare. We have a huge amount of DNA. Uh, it can extend okay. miles and miles and miles and miles. But uh, anyhow, the when it's all wound up, you can see the character, characteristic visible chromosome. How we get a, a karyotype is we take venous blood, go through a, a, fair, a, a various different steps, adding colosin and uh, saline and that sort of thing, spreading cells, and then you treat with trypsin to get rid of the uh, the cells so they dump the uh, DNA uh, and then it's up to a karyotypist now to make sense out of all of those chromosomes as you can see here they line them up and all of they have the size the banding patterns where the centromeres are are all characteristics uh, for uh, what a karyotypist does typical norm normal karyotype has 46 X and Y or XX. So X and Y is male, XX is female. Abnormal ones usually are de determined by the number of the chromosome, as you can see here, and then whatever the uh, aberration is is delineated after that. Uh, the banding patterns are unique, and uh, where the centromere and then the banding patterns, we have the uh, P and Q arms of uh, the uh, chromosome and it, it's very unique so usually the P is for the top and the Q is for the bottom you can see that and so karyotypists will take this sort of information and make sense out of it so uh, they can make recommendations to the doctor as to what the uh, the chromosome aberration if there is one and then the parents can decide as to what uh, needs to be done this is that lamp brush version of the chromosome under a transmission electron microscope here is a typical karyotype, a human female. You can see all the chromosomes and the banding pattern. They're not quite as perfect as you might see in a, in a drawing rendition of it, but uh, that's the information that is conveyed on each of those. And I, I can tell you that just one chromosome, we have enough information to fill up a library uh, just with chromosome one, if you can imagine having 23 other um, rooms to fill up. 
there are chromosomal translocations and deletions and things that don't move and things that do move and ultimately leading to uh, the variations that we see uh, in the offspring due to uh, some of the uh, issues that may occur or just normal uh, genetic uh, uh, relocations. So some of the disorders, uh, ones you may have heard is the Down syndrome. We actually have the 21 chromosome has an extra chromosome and as a result you can see a karyotype of this. This is what a karyotypist would, would uh, use for determination and let the doctor know. And, and we, we see the characteristic Down syndrome of various stages uh, with that type of change. Turners, we just have one X chromosome and you can see uh, a variety of, of changes that occur as a result of that. Edwards syndrome has a trisomic 13. In other words, we have three chromosomes on 13. And uh, Edwards syndrome tends to be a lot more uh, uh, causing more issues, you can see. And uh, we see a uh, characteristic. Um, we also have a trisomic 18 you can look at and those sorts of things. Kleinfelter syndrome, we have an XXY scenario. Uh, happens one in 1100 births. And this is uh, where you have some characteristics of both uh, male and female and uh, has uh, characteristics that may show up or may not show up. There's a, a situation uh, in a uh, female track team and uh, they were racing and one of the females uh, they thought were, was doping using testosterone. Uh, to improve or to enhance performance and turns out she was Kleinfelters but in a locker room you couldn't tell and so uh, unfortunately they disqualified her but uh, so I'm, I'll leave that for you guys I'm too old for that stuff but Jacob syndrome we have two Y's a Y and Y scenario they usually say that Jacob syndrome uh, are aggressive and they tend to go to jail more because of testosterone um, I don't know how true that is, but it, it, it is a, a situation uh, to, to be uh, aware of anyhow. Uh, so here's uh, Cry du chat uh, syndrome. Uh, I don't speak French very well. Uh, it cries like a cat, and this is a characteristic of a deletion in one uh, arm of the, if you remember, the Q arm of chromosome 5 and it causes uh, that sort of uh, syndrome. So I'm going to stop here and we've gone over a lot and uh, just review I have a uh, worksheet that you can work through I, I've given also uh, along with this package uh, please look at uh, the entire uh, the uh, karyotype of the chromosomes uh, where it delineates all the genes and everything that you can see just so that you can review that and then uh, uh, finish and work through the worksheet. Uh, again, I uh, appreciate your time and uh, I look forward to uh, seeing you at the next uh, lab.